Fairfield Moravian Settlement, just outside Manchester, was built at the end of the 18th century and designed to house a self-sufficient religious congregation. But the Industrial Revolution would ensure that while the buildings and communities survived, it soon ceased to be a thriving economy. This is the story of what remains of the original Moravian settlement, what historical forces transformed it, and what survives today. My understanding of why the settlement was started was they'd come to this country in about 1740 from Germany, the Moravians. It's a very old church. Um, it originated in the Czech Republic, um, but they'd been persecuted there, so they'd had to move. And in about 1730, they'd gone to Hernhut, which is in Germany. And from there, they decided they wanted to go out into the world and be missionaries. And they actually came to Britain because it was like a, a good place for a stopover to, you know, to, to move on to the Americas and places like that. They all lived around the church and were able to be a church family together, referred to each other as brother and sister, met each other a lot in church and worked communally. They had communal houses for the, the single men, the single brethren, the single sisters, even for the widows and widowers. So when they came over to England, they wanted to recreate that type of settlement and that's how they ended up here in Droylsden. At the time we have to remember that there wasn't a lot of help from outside. It was very good for looking after you. You would, ha you would have a living. Uh, you would also, in your old age, be looked after. Your children would get educated. Uh, and as I say, it had good benefits in that. Obviously you had to live within the rules. The idea was that they would work, live and be contained in this as a Christian community and look after each other as well. The Moravian Church is an early form of Protestantism, emphasising education, equality and a direct relationship with the Word of God. I believe the key beliefs and values of the Moravian Church to be not dissimilar from the, the other Christian churches. We are a Trinitarian church. If you're looking about distinctive things of the Moravian Church, I'd stress things like equality, the fact that we refer to each other in official meetings as brother and sister. So even though I'm the Reverend Philip Cooper, when you read the minutes of a meeting that we've had, it will say Brother Cooper chaired the meeting. We have always valued education within the Christian faith. So is it always a plan to bring education? Yes, education is important as well. That comes from Bishop Comenius, who's perhaps not as well known in this country, but especially in Europe, is very well known. He's considered the father of modern education because he believed in books having pictures, children's books. He believed in streaming and he also believed in all being educated boys and girls. I do like the idea of equality, I do like the idea of fellowship. There are kind of those things about the Moravian Church and I also value its history and that it was part of the evangelical revival in this country and its missionary work abroad and the fact that when missionaries went out to these other places they were really interested in going to peoples that had not yet had a chance to hear the gospel. They didn't want to compete with other churches. The community which the Moravians built kept them close, with their work, shops, pub and their houses all in the square. We're right at the end of the 18th century here, because it was 1785 it was built. Um, but as I say, they did have the single sisters, were in the single sisters' house, and then the other side the single brethren. So they wouldn't tend to mix very much. They would have got an education in a living, the families would have had the houses that were around and the children would have gone to the schools as well uh, and been educated up to at least 11. Would be probably very, very full, starting very early in the morning. They would work hard all day and they would probably have meetings in the church in the evening because there wasn't the distraction of television and things like that. So the, the church became the main focus of um, their non-working activity and they would spend a lot of Sunday in there, probably three sessions a day they would have 
and maybe even on the Saturday they would would be there as well. And this room is like has been in a way mocked up like the sisters because we know they had dormitories at twelve. So normally there'd be twelve beds in there. Yeah, well, there would have been twelve beds in their dormitories. Yes. So what would a normal day be like for the sisters? Well, they'd obviously get up and prayers. Uh, then they would do some work, either lace or something else, or laundry, or because they looked after themselves. They had a farm as well, and they would, do, although they did pay some, some of the brothers to do that. It was our practice in those days to establish communities like this, a self-contained village in which people supported themselves as best they could with industries and so on, and also carried the message of Christ to the neighborhood. And so in this place, in the old days, uh, there was everything you could think of that was necessary in a village, its own bakery, its own farm, its own physician, its own watchman at night. It did its own building. Our people here, all these bricks are homemade bricks. Uh, we've mentioned the bakery that the, the men had and they would go out on horseback and sell the, the bread. There was, um, the brethren also had the fire engine which was kept within the church and would use that um, if necessary. And, and it was used on a couple of occasions to put out fires when the fire brigades weren't in existence, when it was only the insurance companies. There was um, a village inn at the corner of the settlement which functioned well into the 1850s. Um, there was um, a butcher's shop as well until the, about the 1850s again. Um, a general store, which was just on the corner of the street up here. The doctor's surgery. So everything was a complete village unit, really. But the utopian world of Fairfield was about to be challenged by a revolution that would quickly undermine its cottage industries and its self-sufficiency. The Industrial Revolution started in Manchester probably from about the 16th or 17th century onwards, but it didn't really pick up pace until towards the end of the 18th century. You had the first mill that was built, I think, in the 1780s in, in the centre of Manchester. That was initially water-powered and, and there was a, a move towards steam-powered mills as well. And what this tended to do is to, to draw in people from the rural environment. Uh, they would see that it, it provided them with particular opportunities which they just wouldn't have had where they were um, in, out in the countryside. There'd be the possibility, for instance, of maybe more regular work, um, possibly higher paid or slightly better paid. Uh, and there'd be the, uh, the intangible benefits of being in an urban space. The Industrial Revolution affected the uh, settlement very much. It affected the work that was, the industry that was going on in the settlement, such as um, the weaving, because they were doing hand weaving. They, had, they, they tried to compete, but there was no way they could actually compete. So this, they, they stopped doing that and other little industries like they used to have a hat making and other things like that all eventually could not compete with the big industrial revolution that was happening and the industry that was springing up. Dirty old town, dirty old town. I think probably the, the industries were affected mainly because there was far more competition outside. Um, the men used to have the bakery in the single brethren's house. They baked the bread. And I would imagine that once the, there wasn't as many people, men living in the single brethren's house, they didn't need to do the jobs that they had. and. And people baked their own things as well in those days. So. Yeah, I think the end of the self-sufficient society was definitely caused by the Industrial Revolution. And not long after this settlement was built in 1785 came the Industrial Revolution, which started in Manchester. And so instead of being a, being a self-sufficient community, 
and people working on the land, basically uh, fa farming the land, um, they, they went out to work in the local mills and things like that. There was still a labourer who was going round in 1855. It was probably the Industrial Revolution. They couldn't, you know, compete with what was being, although it was handmade, they would be making stuff that was a lot more. quicker. Quicker. And more of and by machine. The move towards mechanisation in, in the towns uh, had a, a particular impact on, on the, 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 the cottage industry uh, away from the town. Uh, increasingly, uh, there'd be a, a system where people would, would um, provide work, would do their work for some kind of agent uh, who, who would buy and sell on behalf of uh, some enterprise in, in the town. Um, and this tended to undermine uh, the independent operator at home, say the, the, the weaver or, or something at home, w would find that, that, uh, that the work that they were doing traditionally was being done much faster, much quicker, um, by using machinery in, in the town. I think it was a natural progression that industry was outside and available, um, and so it was just easier to go out and work. They were attractive for, for all manner of reasons, and, and one would be the, uh, the, the sheer change that it offered. It would mainly be sort of work driven. Um, they, they would, it's, it's the sense of opportunity which they would not have had if they'd stayed where they are. And so that tended to have a, a, an impact on, um, on the available labour force out in the, the rural environment too. The Industrial Revolution would swiftly replace cottage industries with cheap mass employment and William Blake's dark satanic mills. By about 1830, um, locally some mills had been built. Christie's Mill was built in Droylsden. Made towels, you might have heard of Christie's Towels. Courtauld's was in Droylsden as well. Um, and so then it was, they were pay paying better wages than people could make from the cottage industry of spinning and weaving that was going on here at the settlement. So I think that enticed them to go and work out in the community. It was the mills and also, I mean, we've got in the records where, where they were being influenced by things that were going on outside. Uh, like, obviously they had mills here, they had textiles here, and they got word that they were coming, you know, when they came out on strike, they wanted the people to come out on strike here and they wanted them to join in a union so they were getting if you like sucked into what was going on because Manchester had exploded by this time and obviously was reaching it much closer here to what was going on and you forget that Hyde and Ashton and those areas were big hotbeds of political change as well in the country and, and of course Manchester with the industrial revolution Manchester expanded tremendously and, and so this just became a suburb of Manchester and were surrounded by, by, by houses. All the small industries by 1850 had gone out of the settlement. They all, that's when they all started to change to housing, so they became houses. And the church probably didn't, I mean, they used to worship most days, that probably stopped because obviously they were tied to the mill times and, or wherever they were working. So it, became more Sunday-based worship. Although the workplaces closed, Fairfield retained its religious commitment with the Moravian Theological College training ministers for overseas missions running from 1875 to 1958. When I think about Fairfield and how it's developed and changed, I'm not sure I would think of it as exactly failing, but more that, you know, in the 1700s, life was very different to what it is now. And over a period of time with the Industrial Revolution and the change in manufacturing, etc., then the settlement had to change, you know. I mean, when you talk about cottage industries and Lidl doing fi ladies doing fine needlework and things, that, that was bound to change. It had to adapt, and, and it has done. Yes, it was a gradual, it didn't happen overnight, but it took probably about 40 or 50 years, as I say, for it to change from, from being a work with work in it to a residential place. 
Perhaps, finally, Fairfield Moravian settlement has survived not only because of its faith and its mission, but because of its architecture, the way it was designed and built back in 1785. To some extent, the kind of community element has probably been diluted a bit over the years. I think st people who live here still value the setting and they value that it's, it, it, it's heritage in the sense it, it, it is a Moravian settlement. But I think there are people now living in the settlement that know next to nothing about our history and, and, and don't value it in the same way. So it has been diluted, that community sense of living, but it's not disappeared altogether. I think it survived because people was, were, had a, it was a good place to worship God. Uh, you know, it's, it's not got any very stringent rules or things like that. It, your, your conscience is expected to, uh, and it was also a good place to live. I mean, you know, that's the reason why I moved in, because it was a good, safe place, space to live. People look still do look after each other. It has survived as a religious and social settlement, I think, in some ways, in the sense that um, I'd say maybe, you know, 50% of the people who live in this settlement or thereabouts have, are either members of the church or have some connection to it and value it. Um, and I do think there's still a great deal of care that goes on. I think it still survives today because it's been willing to change and adapt slightly. Probably not as much as some places, but I think there's also the community feel about the place, which has encouraged people to want to stay within the church. And it is a nice feeling to belong to something and to know people care about you and ask about you and look after you. So I think people always enjoy that side of um, the church, you know. Um, and I think probably by, by adapting and changing and accepting more modern ways, the only way to move forward. If we'd have stayed as an enclosed community, we'd have been, you know, out, well, we'd have disappeared a long time ago.